and Brahmins who say, the recluse Gautama is one who leads astray. He teaches the annihilation, the destruction, the extermination of an existing being. But then the Buddha says, I do not proclaim this, and so I'm baselessly, vainly, falsely, and wrongly misrepresented by them. Okay, so because the Buddha teaches non-self, so the Brahmins, you see, especially the Brahmins, are very strongly attached to the idea of self. And so when they hear the Buddha teaching anatta or non-self, they think the Buddha is an annihilationist. He teaches that the person at death comes to a complete annihilation, to a complete end, and there's absolutely nothing existing beyond death. And then they think that nirvana too must be the complete annihilation of an existing being. We have a real being existing, and then what happens at death is that that real being breaks up and is destroyed. What the Buddha teaches is that there are these five aggregates that make up the living being, and the attainment of final nirvana is just the ending of this process, this conditioned process of the five aggregates. And so the Buddha says, both formally and now, what I teach is just dukkha and the cessation of dukkha. Sometimes this is translated, what I teach is only suffering and the cessation of suffering. I have to say, I don't think this is quite correct, because there's no word here which means only. That's the word that translators introduce. And he says, what I teach is suffering. And that statement has to be understood not to mean that this is the entirety of what the Buddha teaches. Since the Buddha teaches many other things, he gives advice to kings on how to rule the kingdom, advice to people on how to meet together and live in harmony, advice to parents, how to treat their children. So it's not just suffering and the cessation of suffering. But this sentence has to be taken in its context. Here it's intended as a kind of reply to the accusation of the Brahmins and the ascetics who say that the Buddha teaches the annihilation of a living being, of a truly existing being. So he, the Buddha is saying, I don't teach the annihilation of an existing being. Since the existing being, that's a being misconceived as the kind of self. But what the Buddha is saying is that I what I actually teach is that what we call the living being are these five aggregates, which are dukkha. And so the purpose of the teaching is to bring an end to this process of the five aggregates that constitutes dukkha. And so now the Buddha is going to show the sort of subjective impact of his teaching. He says, if others abuse, revile, scold, and harass the Tathagata on that account, the Tathagata, now he's referring to himself, as the Buddha, on that account feels no annoyance, bitterness, or dejection of the heart. And if others honor, respect, revere, and venerate the Tathagata for that, the Tathagata feels no delight, joy, or elation of the heart. This is very important advice especially in the religious climate today, when people become very contentious about their religious belief. You know, if you speak ill of some religious teachers, then their followers can become very angry, aggressive, hostile. And if you do it under the wrong circumstances, you can get beaten or even, I'm sorry to say, even killed. <laughs> but this is the advice of the Buddha. 
if, well, he's going to come to that in the next paragraph. If others abuse, revile, scold, and harass, no, he's <laughs> speaking about the, the disciples now, but okay, if others abuse, revile, scold, and harass the Tathagata, then you yourself, the followers, shouldn't become annoyed, angry, or dejected, but just bear it. Maybe you should approve of what they say, but regard it with equanimity. And then if others honor, respect, revere, and venerate the Tathagata, again, don't become elated, like some of the Buddhists when they see Albert Einstein praise Buddhism, or some of the others. When there's a book like Famous Man Who Praised Buddhism, who praised the Buddha, then they become very happy. Oh, Einstein praised the Buddha, or who are they, some of the others? Tiger Woods? Tiger Woods? <laughs> well, <laughs> delete, press the delete button. <laughs> Um, Richard Gere, okay, Richard Gere is a Buddhist, or um, Goldie Hawkins, a Shane Buddhist? Goldie Hawn? Okay, so, excuse me? Tina Turner. Tina Turner, oh, yes. yeah. Katie Lyon. Who? Katie Lyon, she's a singer. Katie Lyon. K.T. Lyon, L-A-N. K.T. Lyon. Robert Yeah, but Robert Thurman is famous as a Buddhist scholar. What we mean is somebody who's famous in another capacity. Bertrand Russell also, I think. Who? Bertrand Russell. Oh, Bertrand Russell, yeah. Did he actually praise Buddhism, or did he just... Uh, he, just come, uh, he was never a Buddhist, but yeah. he uh, said a lot of positive things about Buddhism. Okay. So I mean, I'm not a Buddhist, but if I have forced to choose one, I'll choose Buddhism. Excuse me? If I'm forced to choose a religion, I'll choose Buddhism. That's what he said. That's what he said. So then we get all excited and happy. Oh, so and so praise Buddha of Buddhism. So he says, you shouldn't become elated, delighted, and uplifted in the heart. Okay, so when they honor the Buddha, then the Buddha thinks they perform such services as these simply in regard to what was earlier fully understood. In other words, they revere him on the basis of his wisdom and understanding, so he doesn't take it personally. And then he gives the same advice to the monks, you should behave in the same way. Okay, now we come into the next section, which is again the kind of returning to this theme of non-self. So we're getting it hammered at us from different angles, repeatedly brought home to us from different angles. The Buddha says, therefore, whatever is not yours, abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. Okay, this seems reasonable, sensible, rational. And now the Buddha says, what is it that is not yours? Material form, the body is not yours. What are you saying, man? The body isn't mine. Abandon it. No. I have to put on some of the dye to make my hair look <laughs> dark. It's getting gray. <laughs> I have to put on some tanning lotion so people will think I've been down to Florida sunbathing. <laughs> I have to work out with the weights to make myself look strong and muscular. How can you say, give up the body? Why give up the body? Then the Buddha says, when you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. The feeling is not yours, abandon it. Perception is not yours, abandon it. The volitional formations are not yours, abandon them. And then I think I've given up all of those things. At least I have my own consciousness to hold to. 
that's mine. But then the Buddha says, consciousness is not yours. Wait a minute, Buddha. <laughs> I have to have something, right? But the Buddha says, abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. So the Buddha is saying, give up everything that you might become attached to from the form of your body right through to the inner depths of your consciousness. Then he illustrates this with a simile. He says, if people carried off the grass, sticks, branches, and leaves in the rock garden at Thuangyin Monastery, or burn them, or did what they liked with them, would you think people are carrying us off, or burning us, or not doing what they like with us? What do you think? You see, in the rock garden, there are places where the wind broke off some of the branches from the trees. Now, if Mr. Wang, the, the man who takes care of the grounds here, if he collects these broken branches and trees and puts them in a pile, carries them away, puts them in a pile to be taken off the grounds of the monastery, do you think they're taking away what's yours? taking me away, why not? The monks say, because that is neither our self nor what belongs to our self, right? And so the Buddha says, in the same way, whatever is not yours, abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. And what is not yours, again, saying material form, through consciousness. Okay, then finally now, coming to the end of the sutta, the Buddha is going to show, having gone through and given special emphasis here to his teaching of non-self, now he's going to show how in his teaching there are disciples who have reached the different levels of enlightenment, awakening, realization, beginning from the top. So he says, this Dhamma is well proclaimed by me. It's clear, open, evident, free of patchwork. It's a very significant expression. Like we have a piece of clothing, you know, the elbows get worn out, a jacket or a shirt, and so we put a patch over the elbows. Then we get a little tick. Buttons break off, so we have to tie on and sew on new buttons. We get a little tear over the front. We have to sew it up or put a patch over it. And so it's all patched together or sewn together. But the stomach, it's like a piece of whole cloth. There's nothing like inconsistent in it, nothing with internal contradictions. There are no, you know, embarrassing weak spots and that we have to defend it, like say, oh, yeah, this has to be interpreted in this way, you shouldn't take this too literally. Of course, there are some things that shouldn't be taken too literally, but those are not the essential things. Okay, so now the Buddha is going to show that in the Stama, which is clear, open, and so on, there are monks who are arahats. These are ones whose taints have been destroyed, who have lived a holy life, done what had to be done, laid down the burden, reached the goal, destroyed the fetters of becoming, and are liberated through final knowledge. And so for these, the Buddha says, there is no future round of existence to be manifested. So that is the highest level of attainment. Okay, now the Buddha is going to go down step by step. 
Okay, now, again in this Dhamma, which is open and clear, he says there are monks, and not only monks, we also have to understand in this case there will be monks, bhikkhunis, nuns, and also male and female lay disciples who have abandoned the five lower fetters. So we came across the five lower fetters already. And so these are what we call non-returns. They're due to take rebirth, not in the sensual realm, the human realm, they take rebirth in what's called the form realm. Usually it was the pure abodes, and then they achieve final liberation, final nirvana there. And they never come back again to this sensual realm of existence. Then the next level, lower level, there are in this teaching, in this Dhamma, bhikkhus who have abandoned three fetters, these are the three lowest fetters, view of self, doubt, and the clinging to rules and observances, and they've weakened lust, hatred, and delusion. So these are once returners, they come back to this world, the human world, or could be the heavenly worlds, the sensual heavenly worlds, they come back one more time and then put an end to samsara, the round of rebirths. Okay, then we come to the next level. This is the first level of actual realization. He says, there are those monks who have abandoned the three fetters. Again, view of self, doubt, clinging to rules and observances. And they are all stream enterers. They've entered the stream to liberation. They will no longer, they no, they're no longer subject to perdition. Maybe the word perdition is an unusual word, let's say, they no longer are subject to rebirth in the lower realms of existence, the three lower realms, the hell realms, the animal realm, and the realm of the afflicted spirits, sometimes called hungry ghosts. So they don't take rebirth in these three lower realms, and they are bound for liberation, and they're heading for Sambodhi, for full enlightenment. So it's said of these disciples that they take rebirth at most seven more times before they reach full liberation. Okay, then we go to the next paragraph. The Buddha says, In this Dhamma well proclaimed by me, and so on, there are bhikkhus who are they're called Dhamma followers or faith followers. These are disciples who have entered the path to liberation. They haven't yet reached any, even the lowest stage of realization, but they've entered the path and they're bound to reach at least the lowest stage of realization within this very life itself. So they're bound to become stream enterers in this life And then eventually they will reach the full enlightenment. Okay, and then finally the Buddha adds, and this is a bit unusual in this paragraph, he says, this Dhamma is well proclaimed by me and so on. In this Dhamma well proclaimed by me, clear, open, evident, free of patchwork, those who have sufficient faith in me who have sufficient love for me, or devotion to me, are all headed for heaven. <laughs> it seems a, maybe a little bit of a Christian flavor here, <laughs> a little bit like a theistic flavor. Except that for Buddhism, heaven is not the final goal. You know, it's not nirvana, but it's a realm, a happy realm of existence. And one is reborn in the heavenly realm, through the power of merit, of wholesome karma. 
So if one has real deep faith in the Buddha and real sincere love and devotion towards the Buddha, that creates a lot of merit. Of course, one has to be observing the basic principles of morality, of sila, also practicing generosity. I don't think the Buddha would say <laughs> that somebody might be killing, stealing, lying, womanizing, but he goes to the vihara, the temple, every two weeks, bows down to the Buddha image, offers incense, flowers, fruits, then goes home and thinks, I'm heading for heaven. <laughs> but the person will have to be living according to the Dhamma, and based on that person's understanding of the Dhamma, they have a real sincere faith, in the sense of a trusting confidence in the Buddha, and a devotion towards the Buddha based on a recognition of the Buddha's excellent qualities his great wisdom, great compassion, great purity, his skill in teaching many beings. And so that mind of faith, mind of trust, mind of love and devotion generates powerful, wholesome karma, which becomes a condition for a rebirth in heaven. But this person has to understand, of course, that the rebirth in heaven, it's not the goal of the teaching. It's, at best, it can be a temporary resting station. But the person will have to continue to strive on to develop the, especially the samadhi and panya, concentration and insight in order to gain realization or liberation. Okay, so this takes us through the discourse on the snake simile. Any questions? Please. Of 
the Brahmins and other ascetics, well actually some of them were ritualistic, like making the fire sacrifices, um, undertaking certain types of ascetic observances, like long fasts, um, exposing the body to the fire so that one would be able to withstand the heat of the fire, going out naked during the middle of the winter and diving into cold rivers. Um, you find like whole list of them in the suttas. For example, sutta number 12, some of these practices. Like on page 173, the Buddha explains a number of these ascetic practices. These were types of sila bhakti. Okay, but now coming back to the regular Buddhist rituals, what I would say is that ritual can be useful as a way of channeling one's feelings of devotion, reverence, veneration, respect. And so, as Buddhists with some understanding, we don't reject rituals, but what we would reject is the idea that just performing the ritual in a mechanical, automatized way is going to be a means of creating merit or getting wholesome karma. But if one does, like bowing, it goes back to the time of the Buddha, it's in old Indian or even a general Asian way of showing respect and honor to somebody who is extremely worthy. Um, offering things like incense and candles, they each have their symbolic significance, but it's a way of offering things, a kind of self a symbolic type of self-surrender by surrendering things, by offering things that are valuable and beautiful. Thank you. Okay, one quick question. Okay, okay. okay. Then, please take it. Yeah, quick question. Uh, the five aggregates, uh, is that the same as the uh, Rupa Vedana Sanya Sankara Vijnana? Yeah, those are just the Pali. Pali, okay. And the Vijnana is the consciousness. Vijnana is what's Thank you. Um, about the heaven, your description is very similar to pure land, that yeah. would become pure land. Yeah. Um, is there a Pali word for heaven? Is it a thing that gets translated as heaven? Yeah, there is a Pali word. It actually goes back even to, based on the Vedic word, the word in Vedic Sanskrit is Skarga. So the heavens are just, they're conditioned realms of existence. Whereas the pure land is supposed to be a realm that is almost like a special group of heavens that are reserved for non-returners. Like the non-returners are reborn of these, they're actually called pure abodes. And then once they're reborn there, then they don't fall away back to other types of rebirth. And so the pure land seem to be modeled on the pure abodes of the early Buddhism. Any further questions? Okay, please take the uh, mobile microphone. Um, it's about the uh, five aggregates. Um, are they mind fabrication to them? Are they what? Mind fabrication, the mind may provision. Is um, this, for example, uh, the eye with the contact, yep. create consciousness. That consciousness is that mind produced, so the mind grasps to it. Is that the consciousness is the aspect of the mind itself? We don't say that so, consciousness is, is not 
mind produce, but the consciousness is the mind which is doing the producing. So, 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 so is this the mind object then? The consciousness. Yes. No, the consciousness itself is not a mind object, because consciousness is what is aware. So, the object is distinct from the consciousness. So, say the visual consciousness, it's the consciousness which is aware of visible objects. Or hearing consciousness is consciousness which is aware of sounds. The sound is the object, the consciousness is what is aware of the sound. Yeah, but the storyline is, is the mind produced that storyline, so we grasp to those storylines? Of course, the mind produces many we call storylines and narratives, and that production of narrative or storyline becomes something of the basis for our sense of grasping to the I, to the sense of personal identity. Okay, thank you. Okay, I want to take some of these questions from the internet. Okay, Buddhist texts refer to the gods. Buddhists these days seem somewhat equivocal about the existence of a creator god. Is that to avoid religious conflicts? Is that right view? I don't know that Buddhists today are equivocal about the existence of a creator god. I would say that Buddhism is quite um, straightforward and says that at least according to the Buddhist teaching, that there is no cre creator God. But I don't think that this should be presented in an aggressive, uh, antagonistic way, intended to inflame followers of other religions. But when we have like religious discussions, we just speak about from the Buddhist point of view, the world, the universe is without the beginning in time. And so the idea of the creator God becomes unnecessary. But we try also to find what is really of value in the idea of the Creator God, like some principle of cosmic justice, some way of certifying the value of good actions, like generosity, kindness, love, self-sacrifice for others. And then we affirm that, but without affirming the Creator God. Okay, in practice, how does one abandon consciousness? Is it possible without samatha or jhana state samadhi? <clears throat> okay, one abandons consciousness by seeing the consciousness as being not mine, not I, not myself, to the point that one is able to cut off identification with the consciousness. So that would really take place, probably when we say it's only the arahat who has completely abandoned consciousness. But is this possible without training in samatha or jhana? This is a point which is being debated amongst Buddhists. Um, according to the mainstream Theravada tradition, there is, and not only the Theravada but some of the other early schools, there is a possibility for developing insight without relying on the training in samatha or jhana. So the power of very sharp insight one could gain, even at the stage of once returner, the stage of stream entry once returner, perhaps non-returner and even arahant. But probably in order to ensure a greater stability for the development of wisdom, it would be desirable to develop summit or samadhi to some extent. And this is my opinion, others will have different opinions. <laughs> okay, para, uh, question seven, can we say that the consciousness of an arhat is traceable because we cannot find it in any other person but only in that particular enlightened person? <laughs> if that's what is meant by traceable, then I think one could say that the consciousness is traceable. Okay, I think we'll stop now and then we'll come back after lunch for a discussion period. Um, before we end, I just want to mention, next week we'll have the class... No, I'm sorry. Next week is... This is April 24th. Next week is May 1st. 
Next week there's no class because we're having this three-day Dharma retreat here. And I'd encourage those who are interested to have like a full weekend at the monastery to register for the Dharma retreat. I think you register on Thursday evening or afternoon? Evening. And then you spend here all day Friday, Saturday, and then we continue half a day on Sunday, and then in the Sunday afternoon there's a special ceremony for the uh, honoring the deceased, the people who, who have died, that's held every year in the spring. Okay, so our next Sutta study class will be May 8th, Saturday, May 8th. And according to the schedule that I had sent out earlier, I had that the next class will be on Majjhima Nikaya Sutta number 24. But I reflected on that. I think it would be more interesting to go skip that sutta and take Majjhima Nikaya Sutta number 28. This is the greater discourse on the elephant's footprint. I'll also put this in an announcement to go out before the class. So then we'll have classes May 8th and May 15th we'll have classes. And sutta number 28 will almost certainly extend over two classes since it takes time to explain. Okay, we'll end with the sharing of the merits. So, from speaking on Dhamma, from doing a meditation, speaking on Dhamma, listening to Dhamma, discussing Dhamma, we accumulate wholesome karma. Now we share this wholesome karma with the deities, the Nagas, the Bhutas or fear spirits, asking them to be well and happy and to protect the world, the Buddha Dhamma, and ourselves. Akasata Jabhumata Deva Naga Mahitika Punyanta Nanuma Ditva Chiramra Kantu Sasana Akasata Jabhumata Deva Naga Mahitika Punyanta Nanuma Ditva Chiram Rakantu Desana Akasa Ta Chabuma Ta Deva Naga Mahitika Punyanta Manumo Dipa Chiram Rakantu Mamparam Eta Ta Cham Hehi Sampadam Punya Sampadam Sade De Manumo Dantu Sapa Sampati Sidiya Sabe Bhutanamo Dantu Sabe Sampati Siddhya Sabe Sadhanamo Dantu Sabe Sampati Siddhya Baba Gupadaya Vichy Etato Etantare Satakaya Bapana Rupi Arupicha Asanya Sanino Dukha Pabochantu Pusantu Nibhut 